It's the politicization of faith. This is a big one. This is a heavy one. You don't want to miss out. Hello, <laughs> welcome to the British Isles Council of Prophets Big Conversations. <laughs> <laughs> you had to read that from your notes. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> right, okay. Adele? Yeah. Right, okay. So we're here, we're here with Emma and Simon and Louise and Adele, and Don't I'm excited think. to be here. We're excited to talk. We've been uh, recording all morning, so we're a little bit drunk in the spirit. Um, <laughs> but we're glad to be here. So what are we talking about today? We're going to talk about the politicization of faith. This is a big one. It's a significant one. Yeah. It's a really important one. It's important that we get to grips with this because it's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing in the prophetic world at this time and in this season. Adele, kick us off. <laughs> that's punishment. That's, fun. that's punishment. <laughs> For forgetting his name. Well, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> You're supposed to be a prophet. A prophet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil, let me throw it back to you. What do you mean by the politicization of the faith? <laughs> <of the Korean? laughs> Unpack that a little bit for us. Well, that's why we're here. Anyone want to jump in with that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring us back on track, Emma, quick, quick. Go to that end of the table for this one. The sensible end of the table. Oh, I can really remember your name. I, I think that when Jesus is in Luke, we're in Luke chapter four, and um, Jesus is in his temptation and he's being offered the kingdoms of yes. the world. Mm -hmm. um, Well-known, well-walked scriptures. And he basically says, look, I, I, don't, I don't want the kingdoms of the world. Mm -hmm. And our start point there right back in scripture is if Jesus doesn't want the kingdoms of the world, then neither should we. Mm -hmm. And the sense then is that we have become obsessed in the wrong way with the kingdoms of the world. And once we become obsessed with politics, we fail the church. And we have got to admit that, and let me um, read from my notes that some of you will have heard me uh, teach from before, that we have to admit that evangelicalism is now defined not by its core truths, not by its theology, not by its mission, not by its outreach, not by its harvest, not by its willing, winning of souls, but evangelicalism is now defined by its obsession with politics. Mm. And politics should be the place where we are outwinning souls, but instead we have made politics the place of our own salvation. salvation. And we then have lost the ability to interrogate the present, to challenge the political structures, because we are looking at the political structures as being the place that will rescue us, the place that will back us in our, you know, a fight against heresy. And we now have got to say that we are maybe married to the empire spirit more than we would like to admit, because we want this politics to come to the aid and to the rescue of the people of God. And so what that looks like um, is a fascination with a political party, with political candidates, with making your prophetic revelation uh, start well, but then end with a political um, kind of uh, comment tacked onto the end of it, because we now believe in the whole of evangelicalism that politics must come to the rescue of the people of God, mm. rather than us saying, you're a mountain of the world world and we speak truth to you, we are now totally a politicalized faith structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very serious. And I, can, will, will I keep going, mm -hmm. being cheeky? Why yeah, why not? And sure. pushing it, yeah. pushing it. I've never stopped you before. I've never stopped you before. <laughs> I'm glad I'm amongst friends. 
I think prophets are now in danger when they make every revelation end with something prophetic or apply something prophetic that was never given in it. They're in danger in drowning in their own poisonous words. I think when you take a political side as a prophet, you have to take a position of hate because to take a political side means you are hating another side. It means that we are an embarrassment to the Bible because we are not recognizable as biblical prophets who are being the dissidents and the revolutionaries who are challenging the mountains of the world. I think our biblical roots have morphed um, and we've lost them and we are people with over-realized political sensibilities. I think we are leading the people into non-biblical worldviews where biblical beliefs are lesser than political identity. I think prophets, I know I'm saying some very strong things. I hope you're going to temper it and fix it. Um, <laughs> prophets are no longer defined by their biblical convictions, but they're defined by cultural impulses, their own desires and their own political cultural opinion. And we are now prophesying not biblical evangelicalism, but something I would call cultural evangelicalism. Wow. We are in a horrific hybrid of the Bible and our own Western culture. This is not a recent shift. It didn't happen in the last four years, the last 10 years. It is a culmination of a 50 plus year journey where we enshrined, here's how it happened. We enshrined many years ago, the wrong sort of authority. Oh, authority of empire, authority of domination, an authority of I will take my mountain, an authority that lost any sense of of serving that lost any sense of changing the world one heart at a time or any any real mature understanding of how culture actually changes or how the kingdom of God is, is not this dictator through law, but it's a change person by person from the heart. And once we started to love dictatorship and empire top down, we then were led by Satan into the politicalization of our faith and now our prophets are political animals and therefore we are not purified. I'm sorry, that was long and very opinionated. Strong. And, and you Good. Know, I think that, that whole thing with empire, we're going to get into that yes. in, in another one or maybe we'll touch on this one. Yes. But that, that biblical worldview is really important when we grasp this. Yes. Because if we don't, we're going to be looking towards um, false understandings of what politics is, and, yes. and what what the world is so so again Sam too, um, why <laughs> did, Sam why no but you see the thing is it is important no, it is important, important because right Sam too is uh, one of the most significant theological foundations for the New Testament mm. yes um, it's where John three sixteen comes out of yes um, it it talks about the the eternal nature of the son. Uh, within it. today you have begotten me. That word today means the eternal now, not yesterday you weren't my son. It's today, ongoing, present mm -hmm. reality. Yeah. Um, and it goes, why do the nations rage? So that's 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 the first point. The nations are raging, right? Yeah. And whenever the Bible's speaking about nations, it's not talking about political entities as such. That's empire. Yeah. It's talking about people groups, mm. right? Yes. So that's important. The Why do the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves. So you got yeah. temporal rulers. Yeah. And the rulers take counsel together. Yes. Now, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, that word ruler is the same word that Paul translates as principality. Mm, yeah. Okay. So you've got the temporal yeah. and you've got the spiritual. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they are together. And what they're looking to do is to speak against the Lord yeah. and against his anointed, against his Christ, mm -hmm. saying, let us burst their bonds apart. Let us cast their cords away from us. Yeah. So there's this... Uh, the sense of the nations are in rebellion against God yep. because they are under the authority of demonic rulers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that applies to every nation biblically except for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Which, which is, is the is, only nation in the Old Testament God covenants with. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. They are my inheritance, yes. says mm -hmm. the Lord, right? So you have the sense that the concept of governmental nationhood within the world is going to be tainted in some way by the demonic. Mm -hmm. And rather than there being seven mountains, biblically, 
there's two mountains. Mm. There's Mount Zion yeah. and there's Mount Safon, the mountain in the north, which is where the enemy wants to exalt himself mm. and there's where God wants to exalt himself. Yes. Simon, do you want to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just reflecting on all the, all of this stuff. The, the, I'm trying to think, what's the reaction? What, yeah, what's going yeah. on in people's mm. heads? So when you say mm -hmm. um, we mustn't be political, are we saying therefore God doesn't want Christians in politics? No, no. Are we saying God will never bring a move of God through a politician? No, no. no we're not. But what we are saying is this: God is not locked into mm. a formulaic process yeah. that says if you want to transform a nation, then first you get the politicians saved, then you get a a, a, a Christian whoever, then you get Christian laws, then you get this. Yeah. Why do we know that's true? We know that. That's true Absolutely. because look at India, look at yeah. North Korea, look at the nations where revival is. Mm. And if you were going to reduce God down to a methodology, you would say that our primary goal needs to be to get hostile government and, yes. persecution, and persecution of the church. church. And then yeah, you'll get a move of God. But we know that that's not true either because actually the yeah. Lord's not contained or restrained by any of these things. So actually the moment that you reduce God down mm. to a formula, you're immediately making a god in your own image mm -hmm. we're pulling him yes. into a but into a shape that he doesn't fit he's the is the limitless one the almighty yeah. one mm -hmm. and the moment you try and put him into an a b c d mm -hmm. You're immediately losing the plot anyway, aren't that's you? Right. That's right. And it's this is why Jesus doesn't want the nations, because he wants one nation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. A that's that's people. what he's after, yes. a chosen people. Yeah. And that's where you see in in Revelation five, why mm -hmm. is the Lamb worthy? Mm -hmm. He's worthy because through his blood he has purchased the people for himself, mm -hmm. for, yeah. for God, from mm -hmm. every tribe, every nation, every language, every tongue, mm -hmm. and they will be kings and priests who reign mm -hmm. on the earth. That's that's yeah. what he's after whenever he's whenever God says to him, Ask mm -hmm. of me and I'll give you the nations. Why do you want a nation so I can make one nation? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. because because I hear a lot of the this kind of commentary of um, uh, I want to have nations to take you know before the throne uh, because of course you're you're quoting the first bit of sand to ask for the nations. I kind of feel a little bit. Didn't you read? the yes. end of the one chapter when he dashes them all to pieces. Mm -hmm. So for me... Which is quoted three times in the New Testament, that scripture yes. about the rod of iron. Yes, yes. smashing the nations to pieces um, be because their structures are not kingdom structures, you know. Yes. So um, for me, the, the foundation of all of this is a misunderstanding of how Christianity works. Mm -hmm. And it, it, Christian, what Christian values really are, and I think we we merge um, uh, this the, the line between national identity and Christian identity. <laughs> well, this is what my nation says I am, so that must be what Christ says I am, and it, and it misunderstands what are how Christianity works. And I think that is really at the root of it. How does Christianity work? Mm. Does it want people in places of influence? Yes, it clearly does. Does it want people who are gifted in politics? Yes, it clearly does. Esther, Daniel, Joseph, and so on. But fundamentally, it's a misunderstanding that law doesn't save. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that, for me, is the sentence yep. that is at the base of this monster that's grown in the house of God. We think if I get good leaders in place who make the law righteous, mm -hmm. we will be saved by the law. Mm -hmm. And surely we are long enough in the tooth to know that law has never saved anything. Yeah. So the Herculean effort that comes from the body of Christ makes us great political lobbyists, maybe great intercessors to back our political lobbying, mm -hmm. but is it's based around a lie that law saves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you jump into politics because you think politics constructs the law, whereas Christianity has never one day in its life worked by change the law and the nation is saved or the heart is changed. Christianity has always said, 
you you come to the lordship of Christ, mm -hmm. you yield before his lordship, and then actually you change your behavior yeah. and, and law almost becomes obsolete yeah. because you're acknowledging his kingdom and the way he does things. It starts with the heart first, right. not with the law. That's and if you think the law is the primary place of transformation, you are Islamic in your orientation. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter what the laws are. If the heart hasn't changed, people yeah. will continue to do what they want. And I yeah. think there's... There's almost an, an escape it, uh, escapism around this of yeah. I'm going to put all my energy into praying yeah. for a particular leader or a particular yes. law mm. and I'll put all my energy and focus into that because actually to look at one's own heart and one's mm. own responsibility and the role of the church mm. yes. is is just not on most people's yes. yeah. thought patterns mm. and, and so it's easier to hope that that person over there can fix this rather than go, well, hang on, in the New Testament, Paul, through his preaching, turned the whole mm -hmm. town, city, nations upside down. You think yeah. about Martin Luther. If you want to yeah. see, can the Western world be changed in a day? Yes, yes it can. Mm -hmm. You look at the Reformation and Martin Luther mm -hmm. putting up his theses of revelation from the world and from the word, and that changed the whole civilization yeah. from that revelation mm -hmm. in his heart that worked out. So it's that yes. yeast, that seed, mm -hmm. the small things mm -hmm. of the kingdom that expand mm -hmm. rather than this understanding of we go for the power structures and, and that will affect yeah. people's and you hearts. And you see this political spirit sneaking well, it's not even sneaking, it's storming at times, yeah. into into prophecy. I remember sitting in a meeting, I think you might even have been with me, Emma. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a prophetic word, and I used that loosely, <laughs> um, of a statement saying, uh, England, if you do this, and it was England, if oh, you yes. do this, God will give you your empire back. Oh, I remember oh, it. Glory and and I, I kind of sat there, I leaned over to Emma and said, We've been trying to get rid of that for the last ten yes. of the years, yes. and 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 the 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 sentiment, the mm. heart of it was mm -hmm. not bad. The heart of it was we want you to be back in your place of influence yeah, and fulfilling. We yes. want you to be doing that. Function. But the senate, but the the root system to get there was wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I, I I'm just sitting there reflecting on. If you were to look at history, when would you point at a time mm -hmm. in the church's history that you'd say at that point, there a critical moment that the church lost its teeth historically? I'd have to say that the moment was when Rome institutionalized the church mm -hmm. and the church became part of state. Yes. It's almost, it, it's almost like God, the, 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 mm -hmm. the devil said, well, I can't kill you. Mm -hmm. and I can't stop you. So what I do is I'll make you part of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah and I think that we're going to get on to that uh, in, in a bit. But I think yeah. that there's, there's something we need to touch here because, you know, mm. we want to have positive influence mm -hmm. in course, the world. Yes. And we want to see godly laws in place. Absolutely. Because actually godly laws form protection yeah. of the safety. innocent, right? Yes. They form safety. Yes. Yes. So we want to see that place there. So we want to be of positive influence within the world that sees laws come mm -hmm. forth. But there's also the acknowledgement that we can't say we're a Christian nation because there's no such thing, thing as, as a Christian, Christian nation, nation yeah. because you have Christians in a nation being salt and light mm -hmm. rather than you come into a nation and therefore you're Christian. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a huge yeah. shift in our understanding mm -hmm. yes. because we need to come back into alignment mm -hmm. with what actually biblical Christianity is. Yes, and, and uh, you see, here's here's the deal. In that, you're now pushing us into the concept of sheep and goat nations. And uh, I mean, you took us there, Phil Sanderson. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. yes. Now, I do understand that in the um, uh, American uh, standardized version, the American version of translation of the Bible, is that the right title? American standardized version. Uh, the, American ver the American Bible. You actually get in the text a mistranslation. You get the translation of sheep and goat nations. It's noteworthy that that is not in any other translation of the Bible, yeah. only in the American standardized version. You also must note that that is not what is in the original text in the Greek in the New Testament. Have you turned to that scripture yeah. to read it? What version have you got there? So I've got the ESV. Okay. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory 
and all the angels with him. He will sit on his glorious throne. Before him he will separate. He w- before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people yeah, there we go. one from another, as yeah, a shepherd well. separates sheep from the goats. The word there, people, is ethnos. Which is really important. He separates people. Now, here's the deal, because we then go into sheep and goat nations. I've heard a hundred prophetic words about sheep and goat nations. It's incredibly biblically illiterate um, uh, to bring that kind of nonsense, because how do you get saved? Do you get saved because your nation is saved? Well, that's nonsense. Yeah. You, again, we're back to how does Christianity work? You get saved because what? You personally acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A nation does not have the capacity to do that. So the concept of a sheep or goat state or a sheep or goat nation or a sheep or goat county is, 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 is grotesque biblical illiteracy, which at its core has not asked the question, what is salvation yeah. and how does salvation salvation work out so and and if you buy into that you go down the road of rampant nominalism you go down the road of uh the concept of christendom as a as a de facto this is why you're a christian because you're part of this nation Mm -hmm. in the same way that if you are a saudi you're automatically muslim or something like that there and it is a horrendous error because you because actually what it does it denies the criteria for salvation yes from yes confession of jesus as lord and belief in the resurrection uh-huh. to national identity mm-hmm. yes i'm saved because i'm in a so-called christian nation yeah. well w- can a nation re- repent N- no only the individual people in the nation can repent can a political party repent no only the individual people in a political mm-hmm. party can repent and it's ascribing souls to nations yeah. that that's or ascribing a soul to a movement or to a political party is a is a crazy crazy illiterate thought or to nations that didn't actually exist biblically because yeah, well, we, there is that because we define nations in a completely different way that the yeah, bible defines nations this is true so so you can see how these you know poor translations and misunderstandings where we don't don't go, you know, can, can I, can I, am I brave enough to challenge our, you know, or to all of us, am I brave enough to challenge our cultural prescribed default setting? So in all of that, when you're trying to then become a political lobbyist, because you think that if you get the good leader or the good law changed, Jesus will love you more or your, your nation will be more righteous or your nation will be saved and all of that nonsense thinking, you have to make Jesus sound vengeful because you have to make him anti a political party or anti the others. So you suddenly make Jesus Christ quite ugly and, oh, well, you lot, you know, are beyond the bounds of salvation. Whole parties, whole people groups, whole other nations, because we're a righteous nation or we're a righteous state or we're a righteous county and you're not. Well, mm. and also what you're doing is saying one sin is worse than the other. Well, if this party's against this, but this party's yes. against that, well, this one's worse than that. So, you know, it, it, it's yeah. not I mean, a if, if, you take it, if you were to actually sit with most Christians, most, I say, and you say to them, if I take... Um, a a couple of values from the Bible and then I Mm -hmm. put them with a few of my ideas and then Mm -hmm. I create something from that, would that be okay? Would it be godly? Most would go, no. And yet in the same logic, capitalism, socialism, Mm -hmm. fascism, Mm -hmm. all the isms, if you look, I mean, they all have Mm -hmm. elements yeah. of truth in them. I mean, there's probably some mm-hmm. that you'd say absolutely mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. but but you could say, well, there's a biblical truth there, there's a biblical truth here, but why are we exalting that truth above this truth? What, what, how does that work? Mm-hmm. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of, of this, this world. world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's within it. those systems, not those systems. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus, what yeah. did he do when he came? Well, did yes. he get involved in politics? No. Yes. Well, yes and no. He spoke. <laughs> he spoke to the systems. He spoke to politics, but he didn't yeah. do what people expected no, him to do. Yeah, he I mean, they. Ex- savior, that's yeah. Right, that's yeah. He, he, they expected him to come. Fantastic. We're going to get the kingdom. You know, it's going to be brilliant when the Messiah comes. Mm-hmm. Well, the Messiah comes, and he actually does more demolishing than he does actually of of building up, and then and gave us a completely different example. So the, the question for me is, yeah. how do we take the way that Jesus operated and functioned, which mm-hmm. was at 
a much higher level. And then how can we encourage one another to speak Yes. to nations, to speak to politics, yep. realising you yep. can never legislate for the heart. Yeah. Um, that's personal choice, that is, is conviction. Yeah. But how we actually train and help one another mm -hmm. and uh, for those who are watching so mm -hmm. that they can have a, an input into politics without being subject, subjected by politics or, yeah. or uh, a wrong enmeshing yeah. with the political spirit. So I think there is legitimacy in being involved in politics, but I think it is illegitimate to come under the spirit of politics. Correct, yes. yeah. yeah. I think there's a, a, a big difference here because what the spirit of politics does is that it polarizes and draws apart and mm. pits against each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe Emma and I, you know, we may have more of authority to speak into this because of where we grew up. <laughs> You know, growing up in, we in, in, in the there. troubles, you know, oh, but Northern but Ireland, yeah. but you, you had the the, the polarisation, mm -hmm. but it's the same spirit. And I mean, I was I was noticing this the other day. Uh, I was watching a uh, a comedy YouTube clip on veganism or something silly like that there, and because oh, no, you see, you don't see when Goat Nations now you're no, doing veganism. veganism. Oh, well, oh, okay, goodness. but here's here's the perception <laughs> because the algorithm in YouTube says. Uh, this person's making fun of veganism. Veganism is considered to be a very left-wing thing, even though I don't see how it can possibly be, uh, you know, a dietary choice. Uh, it becomes this left-wing thing, so that's not what he wants, so we're going to go in the opposite direction. And I had some... Uh, the next video was... The carnivore diet? No, 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 it was like a white supremacist <laughs> thing. It was, it was a... It was a, a yeah, Britain's great, we're you know, big up the white man kind of stuff. And you're like, what on earth is this? Because yeah. what happens with the political spirit is that it pits one side against yeah. the other. It's divisive. It makes it divisive and puts them as far away as possible yeah. so that it can create hate between the yeah. two of them. And yeah. and yeah. Uh, But it's the same spirit behind both of them. Yeah. And it causes us to go, oh, well, if I'm against this, I must be for this. Yes. Without actually thinking. We don't, we lose our minds. Do you want to come on veganism? <laughs> As a former preacher. <laughs> can I just contrast the Old and the New Testament here? In that, I think very legitimately, pre the arrival of the kingdom, which this is really another major understanding we have to come, that it should be surely biblically obvious. Pre the arrival of the kingdom in the New Testament, New Covenant, when you're in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, all of the stuff that's going on there, can I say pre the kingdom? Pre the kingdom, what are your options pre the kingdom? Your options are influence. So you, that's where you get Daniel and Joseph and Esther and the ones that we love and we talk about a lot because you don't have a kingdom to build because Jesus hasn't come to say my kingdom is at hand. So you only have the concept of influence. Mm -hmm. When you jump into the new covenant and Jesus comes and you get the birth of the kingdom and the birth of the church and the ecclesia, this ruling governing body, you get a completely different option and you start to see different language appear. So rather than the language of influence, which people still are called to do, you then get the language of building. Mm -hmm. And you got to then compare and contrast the language of influence, Old Testament, versus the language of building, New Testament. In other words, we build the kingdom. And of course, you get nods of that in Isaiah, of the increase of government, peace, there'll be no, no end. But you get the sense of, I am supposed to depopulate the kingdoms of this world. Yes. Populate the kingdom of God by building. Very practically, what does that mean? We build the education systems, we build the economics, we build the banks, we 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 build. And we have lost the sense of building the kingdom of God for the concept of I want to be an influencer. Now you can still influence, but when a whole movement or whole church structure, a whole generation of people have zero building anointing, building understanding, building mandate of the kingdom of God that has gone from their psyche. You're in a very dangerous place because all you've got is how can I influence politics? And then what happens whenever your whole remit is based on influence, you start to define your success by how influential the people you're speaking to mm. is. There you go. And then it's a numbers game. Yeah.
So politically Any oriented reason. Christians look for significance in their connection with politically significant figures. But isn't it just uh, the understanding of real power, real government, and real authority yes. is what is lacking. Because yeah. if we truly understand yeah. the biblical mm -hmm. concept of authority, mm -hmm. spiritual authority, mm -hmm. governing, yes. the ecclesia has the, the, the role yes. of governing in the spirit and in the nation, yeah. in the ethnos, in the geographical area you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you start to think about stewardship. I mean, are you mm -hmm. saying building? I would I maybe use the word stewardship. Yeah. A lot of Jesus' yeah. uh, examples were about mm -hmm. stewarding what you've got. You, yeah. You've got it. Yes. If you didn't have it in the Old Testament because you were influencing the yes. power, Jesus is now saying, you have the power. Mm -hmm. You have That's the right. seed. You have the coin. Yes. You, you have, have, the have it. Power. You don't have to try and... Sorry pressure influence the thing over here because you have the thing that needs stewarding you have i have given them the glory yes. mm -hmm. i have given them the spirit and so the kingdom a then mindset. because of that is framed not as mm -hmm. influencing the world but being in conflict exactly. yes. with there you go. what was before yep. so you get these these Again, these two mountains themes. Mm -hmm. You've got Mount Safon, you know, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, in in Isaiah 14, when of the devil's boasting, he's saying, yeah. you know, I exalt myself oh, my to the assembly, yeah. the hill of the assembly yeah. in the north, Mount Safon. And you've got Mount Zion, and you have in Psalm 68 this uh, the, this contrast between the many peaked mountain of Bashan, which is a mountain of the north, uh, versus uh, the mountain of God, Mount, mm. Mount Zion, um, and which is quoted then later on in Ephesians 4, whenever it's talking about fivefold ministry, it comes from the, 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 the Old Testament scripture Paul quotes is from Isaiah 68. Mm -hmm. And so you have this whole concept of actually we're of a different kingdom, yeah. and that kingdom's bringing salt and light and hope and life and joy and peace and something of the heavenly realms to bear on this world that is under the dominion of darkness. Mm -hmm. So we need to be those that are seeing people rescued yes. from one kingdom and brought into another kingdom. That's mm -hmm. how Jesus is smashing it, yeah. Yeah. smashing the kingdom, because yes. he's fragmenting the nations of the world by yes. transferring people from one nation the 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 nations of the world into the the God's holy nation, mm -hmm. which yes. means mm -hmm. that ethnicity has nothing to do with your station within yes. the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You know, yes. so our our churches have got to stop being monoculture, or, mon, or sorry, stop being mo mono ethnic. And start being multi-ethnic, but monoculture, that culture. Yes, yes. Can yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I ask then, how do we feel about our powerlessness? Because we're looking at two or three key principles. We're looking at the principle of when the kingdom started, so the shift of building the kingdom. We're looking at the principle of understanding how salvation works, that it comes through the individual. But I think that we are looking to protect ourselves by something else that we perceive to be powerful, rather than saying, I am yeah. in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. or we are collectively so you know I think there is this sense of you know we are we are scared this fear based trait of is the immorality in the nation going to leave me defenseless is secular humanism going to take over is radical Islam going to rule the day you know I'm f scared of communism I'm scared of socialism uh, that certainly in the American context in the in the um European context, I'm scared of fascism. I'm scared of what we saw rise again w w with Hitler in the far right. I I'm uh, scared of tyranny. I'm scared of dictators. I I I'm scared of other nations. And so in this um, fear versus understanding our power, you then embrace anything that looks strong mm. but rather than say, can we just talk about the absence of the power of God in the people of God? Yeah. So then you're, you're, you're jumping to conspiracy theories because you've partnered with epic fear already. So now we're a, a, a church of, you know, of conspiracy theories everywhere. Why? Because we have such a strong root of fear. Why? Because we didn't understand how powerful we were to overcome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But isn't that the ultimate deception? 
but we don't know who we are yeah, and no, we yeah. don't know what we carry. So how do we throw that off? And as prophets, we need to be mm. prophesying mm. and dealing with that so that the people of God can emerge who are builders and entrepreneurs and mm. thinkers and mm. scientists and ones who will develop uh, things that are mm. as yet unheard of in the in the earth. And so we've, got, we've given ourselves a job there. I mean, you, you, the, the simple fact is the place that you draw your strongest point of identity from is the one that will be defining your identity and your experience. Mm -hmm. So if, we, if you have a people who are drawing their identity saying, I'm a citizen of this world, you then will not engage mm -hmm. with your citizenship of heaven. Very good. And, and, and Paul was clear. Mm -hmm. I think we're in Ephesians 3, I think, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Where he says, we are citizens of God's household. Yes. End of Ephesians 2. Yeah, yeah. end of Ephesians yeah. 2. So we're citizens of God's mm -hmm. household. Mm -hmm. And citizens have, have a legal position and they have legal access yeah. to certain things. And, and, and part of our citizenship mm -hmm. as members of God's household is we're called to say, let your kingdom come mm -hmm. and yeah. your will come be done and and that needs to come through his kingdom you can't bring it I, I i'm english i live in england i can't bring rule into england through france yeah i'm trying to get it from a different place and it's yes. it's tight i mean yeah right Paul said this, sorry, James, a double-minded man will receive nothing. Mm -hmm. So you're living, your identity is you're a citizen of heaven, mm -hmm. but you're trying to see results and success by functioning as a citizen from another world. Yeah. And, and this, this, is, yeah. this, is the, this is the bottom line, mm -hmm. is that we become political whenever we aren't kingdom. Ah. Yes, there you go. There it is, there it is. Uh, my sense on the issue, because we're a Council of Prophets here and we're the core leadership of the British Isles Council of Prophets, so we have a responsibility for many prophetic people in um, not just our own nation, but nations around the world. F and for me, the problem is that you can have some very outstanding revelation. You can legitimately hear God super clearly. And you 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 got this revelatory unction within you, and then you bring the word of the Lord, and you conclude it with nonsense. It's political. So let me give you an example. Are we going into a war season? Well, it's down in our show notes to come to in another one of these big conversations. You'll want to hear that one. We're in an era of war. So how do you conclude that thought with a kingdom mindset? Well, then we're talking about spiritual warfare. We're talking about putting the armor of God on. We're talking about military strategies in, in, with principalities and powers. We're, all of those things. The conclusion isn't then, oh, we need a wartime political leader. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you're back in to say politics saves. Mm -hmm. and, and you're then misdirecting people a, a, again. And, and here's the problem with that. Where is hope? Where do a people hope? Mm. And the more you prophesy about politics, the more you rob Jesus Christ of being our hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And what is the fruit of politics? Well, you, <laughs> you get to the end of the Bible, you get to Revelation 17, 18. Mm. Revelation 17, you've got the, the great prostitute of Babylon, and she's yeah. riding on the back of, of, mm -hmm. of this beast, okay? So you ask yourself, okay, well, well who are these? And there's, there's multiple explanations of who, who they may be. Mm -hmm. um, but Bab the, the prostitute of Babylon, mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing, and there's maybe something we'll expand a bit on later, mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing here is the spirit of politics. Because she's made many nations drunk, right? Yes. She's, there's that whole stuff that's in and around her. Yeah. It's part empire spirit. There's Rome involved in it all. Mm -hmm. I think that what we're seeing in the Bible is a representation of Ishtar in Babylon. Mm -hmm. Okay? And she's riding on the back of this beast, this beast that comes out of the sea. Yeah. So you got to start thinking Leviathan. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's Leviathan about? Leviathan's about chaos. Yeah. The spirit of politics mm -hmm. rides on the back of chaos. Yes. Mm -hmm. And whenever the spirit of politics rides in the back of chaos, mm -hmm. everything around it, the economic systems you're into, to, to Revelation 18, the mm -hmm. trading systems, the, the kings of the world all getting drunk on power and all this kind of stuff, demons are within her. You know, you have, you have this sense that 
actually what you're seeing manifesting is the anti kingdom yes. rather than mm. rather than God's kingdom mm. you know and so that that chaos and chaos in scripture it's really a form of on creation yes uh, huh. a, a reversal of the word of god mm. really needs the word of god to speak into it to bring order in the midst of the chaos mm. can we go round and give top tips on if i'm hearing something about politics which we should do as prophets yeah. what would be some of the questions we would ask ourselves to make sure that if we are given a word about politics, mm. that it's not under the political spirit, but it's under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Because it, there's no doubt that in, that in the changing dynamics of power around the world, um, and uh, God will ask us because he asked many prophets to say, you know, you know, you'll be dead by the end of this day. You'll lose your kingdom. Whether it's Daniel and mm. Belshazzar, they're, they're they're prophesying into political situations. So the likelihood is for you to have to prophesy into political situations is high as a prophet. You can't absolve or, or that and think, well, I'll, I'll only ever prophesy to yeah. the church. Yeah. So can we? Or do we have top tips that we can share? No, we're just now putting you each other on the spot. But what Good. goes on in the heart of the prophet to 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 just go through a checklist? I think you've got to look for surprise. Yes. I think always be suspicious of a word that is confirming what you already thought, your own political persuasions, mm -hmm. what you want to hear. Yeah. If you're hearing things along those lines, you've got to be very careful and weigh it carefully. I think. I don't know about you, but I love it when God says something that I just think I would never have thought that in a million years. Yes. Yeah. And it takes you by surprise. So if you're prophesying according to what you already thought before you sought God, mm. be cautious would be mm. my yeah. first Very thought. helpful. Yeah, yeah, I would say that the fear of the Lord mm -hmm. needs to be really somewhere in the midst. I've just started um, prophesying some stuff about a nation and um, I know there are masses of strings attached to it yeah. and it's a journey because it's not mm -hmm. just one word it has to be multiple mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. because are we not called to guard and to guide the purposes mm -hmm. of God on on earth according mm -hmm. to the revelation that we have and uh, for me a check is is the fear of the Lord on this? That's good. Or actually, mm. am I quite comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. Am I okay when this is, e this is easy to do? Mm -hmm. um, and where the fear of the Lord is, I feel like I am in safe territory yeah. Yeah. in the fear of the Lord. And that's the, that's the position that we want our prophets to be. Because yeah. with right. small, smaller words, encouraging words, they're really, you know, it's great, but it's just a little bit of daily bread. Yeah. But when we're looking for the fullness of the kingdom and massive transformation, mm -hmm. the fear of the Lord must be present. Very good. Yeah, I, I think that there's a sense in which whenever we're in a land, we're almost married to the land as prophets because we want to see the well-being of the land. Mm, yeah. You know, it's at uh, Jeremiah 29. Yeah. You know, you're in Babylon, but look for the good of the of the, uh, the yes, of where yes, you are. Yes. Plant your vineyards, do yes. your thing, inhabit and occupy. Mm. And there's a sense in which whenever we speak a word and there's judgment in it, yes. we do have to have the fear. Mm -hmm. It yes. doesn't matter if we just completely disagree, disagree with people. There's no yes. gleeful judgment, right? But at the same time, there's the we're looking for the good of the land that we're in. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, we live in Scotland. I want to see Scotland thrive. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to see it do well. I want to see it be awesome, you know? And I would hope that, that wherever other prophets are in their particular land, they want to see it thrive mm -hmm. as well because we are not just prophets, but we're interceding on behalf of the land as well. And we're speaking, we're seeking to speak that word that brings order into yes, the midst of chaos. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that um, I can now, I'll put it into a personal experience that might be helpful, mm -hmm. Brexit. <laughs> oh. So Whoa. before the vote, before the vote, the Lord gave me a word that we'd vote to leave. Mm -hmm. And he gave me various different things about why and, and what he was doing in the midst of it. So I'm sitting, I'm writing this down, and he said, now don't give it. Yeah. 
I said, OK, he says, you're not to release this word until after the vote. And I said, OK, well, why is that? He says, because if you release the word before the vote, you would be deemed to be seeking to manipulate people mm -hmm. to cause them to vote right. a particular way. Yeah. And, and I, I think that when we're talking about politics, and I know I've got a lot of flack for this, and some of you might not be happy with me on this, mm. but I don't believe my role as a prophet is to tell somebody else what they should be hearing from God. I believe my role as a prophet is, is, is to help people hear, not tell them what to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And good. when it comes to mm. politics, because it's such a volatile subject, because of the fact it is point blank mm -hmm. impossible, unless you live on Mars with no relationship to the Earth whatsoever, it is impossible for you not to have a political opinion. Mm -hmm. And therefore, even though I might feel and have, and you guys probably have, had words about who's going to win an election, yep. what's going to go on with it, you won't find on my any of my platform, anywhere, you mm -hmm. won't find a prophetic word that I've released where I've said, vote for this person, other mm -hmm. than I've, I prophesied Donald Trump would win the election before I knew what trouble it would get me into, um, which was a long, long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> which time? That was the first, time? The first, was the first time in 2015. <laughs> and my goodness, I got some interesting messages. But the point being is, is, mm -hmm. is, just because God gives you something prophetic doesn't mean it's meant to be in the public arena. Yeah, okay, no, and I think in this day and age, there is a little bit of a tendency of, I've got a prophetic word, I've got a broadcast just, it everywhere. Just, it out, it yeah. just isn't what yeah. you're meant to do. It's, if I had something nice for breakfast, I'd broadcast it everywhere in this day and age. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. I, I, think for, I think for me, it's the conversation about Jesus marries a bride not a nation. Yes. yes. So what I'm always looking for is an understanding in my conversations with God. Where is the bride and what do you need to do in the nation to make the bride more ready? Mm -hmm. So I am less interested about the nation. I'm more, as much as I love the nation and pray for it, I'm more interested about the bride in the nation. So therefore, sometimes I think the word of the Lord is, I will give you the political leader that you dislike and don't want because it will provoke the bride into greater readiness. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question is the long-term understanding of the role of the bride rather than the role of the nation which gets smashed to pieces. Yeah. It's not that God doesn't care about nations, yeah. that's clearly not true, mm -hmm. but that would be my starting point. So when I'm thinking about politics, what are you doing for the provocation of the raising yes. and the purification of the bride? Is the bride overstressed and has been doing an outstanding job and needs a break? Do they need a kind leader? Is the bride lazy and fat and cantankerous and disarrayed and they actually need a really objectionable leader um, to, uh, provoke to, to provoke them? So it's, it's not just, as you said, Adele, um, do I like this leader or not? So I think yep. in all of that, you're then often prophesying opposite to your natural inclination Absolutely. politically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, I would agree with that. Oh, this is tense in, in difficult waters, uh, isn't it? I, I think we, we we need to, maybe whether we want to go into this now, but I think it's worth taking note of the fact, just bouncing off something you just said there, Emma. Yeah. Sometimes God gives you what you pray for, even though he doesn't want you to have it. <laughs> and that is, I mean, we know this. And, and, and if you track mm -hmm. it back, I mean, we're talking about Saul, obviously, but mm -hmm. if you track it back, why did Saul exist at all? Saul existed because the church went into consumerism or the people of God went into consumerism. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah. Sons of, yeah, yeah. the sons of Eli moved into the place that mm. ministry became a context of feeding self yeah, yeah. And, their, and serving self and gratifying mm -hmm. self to the point that now the nation goes, you're that dysfunctional, that system's that dysfunctional. We don't want that anymore. We want this over here because when we look, we want to be, and this is literally what the, what the Israelites said, mm -hmm. give us a king like the other nations. Yeah. Yeah. Why yeah, did yeah. they say it? What was the statement? Samuel, your sons are not like you. 
It's, yeah. It was a rejection of the kingdom of God, and therefore yes. we don't want the kingdom yeah. of God. We want something else. God says, I don't want you to have it, yeah. but you can have it. But before you get it, let me tell you what you're going to get. He's going to he's going to conscribe your children. He's going to drive you in front of his chariots. He's going to take your land. He's going to take this. He's going to take that. He's going to. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the list is horrendous. He gives this big long list, and the Israelites go, "Yeah, we want it," <laughs> and and God gives it to them, and you end up with the with probably one of the first manifestations of the empire spirit, and it comes into the earth because the people of God reject. The, the the godly expression of kingdom. They reject the king. That's literally what God says. They don't get upset, Samuel. They've not rejected you. They've rejected, They've rejected me. me. So the embracing of the political spirit is a direct rejection of the kingdom of God. And, and what happened with the sons of Eli? Yeah. yeah. Because of their consumerization, they yeah. literally lost the glory of God. Serpent's tongue and clenched fist was but the name of his sons. The point you're making there, it, I mean, it would, you know, I feel like a bit like, it's just like, oh my goodness, we, we, we might need a comforting, you know, hold by the spirit of God here in that what you're saying, Simon, if I'm hearing you right is, and what scripture is unpacking is, in the sin of the house of God, in the sin of the leaders in the house of God, it provoked an entire nation to want politics and a man-made structure Rather than the kingdom because the they were so upset with the status of leadership and rather than call for purified leadership in the house of God they wanted anything else outside of it and I, I think there's an interesting process in the life of Eli if yeah. you go for it it says mm. Eli went blind grew fat but I sat down, went blind, grew fat, fat yeah. dropped dead. And, the, and you, mm-hmm. you see this inaction led to, led to blindness, which led to fatness, which led to him sitting at the city gate yeah. going, what's going on? The glory of God has been taken captive, i.e. the Ark of the Covenant's been Dumb. taken captive. What happens next? He falls back off his chair, breaks his neck. And it's then, isn't it, later mm-hmm. that Ichabod... The glorious yeah. departed. It's fascinating that it's mm. the same struggle today. Yes, mm. it's new. Do we want? We want to look like them. We there you want go. what they've got. We yes. don't want to be different. Yes. And this is the call of yes. of being a people who are in the world but not of it, set yeah. apart, yeah. citizens of heaven, on yeah. a pilgrimage, leaving what they know, going it's towards massive. the unknown, uh, and the flesh just wants to go back to Egypt and yeah. have nice food and, and do what the, everybody else is doing. All of the controversies, if you think at the moment, what are the controversies within one of the major denominations in England right now? What's the controversy? The controversy is that the world doesn't like that the values of the church conflict mm-hmm. with the lifestyle of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the response, we'll change our values so that we don't offend the world. What, where is that ever? That is a political yeah. spirit yes, it is. by very nature, it a is. political spirit. Because the thing of it is, the moment that you change your message mm-hmm. to pamper to a worldly perspective, yeah. there will be another perspective comes a little bit further down the road yeah. that demands you conform to that as well. Oh, and we're yeah. called to be of another spirit. We're another called to be kingdom. of another kingdom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's land us. Let's land this. I'm Come going on. to be interested to see we're, you do that. <laughs> well, land the plane. Conclusions we're, we're going to form a conclusion. Six minutes. This. So, <laughs> the, what we're talking about is the politicization yes. of the faith. Okay. So, how would you define a politicized faith, Emma? Uh, okay. Um, several markers. You love your nation more than you love the kingdom. I think that's that's number one. Mm-hmm. Um, you want a seeker-friendly system that doesn't challenge or provoke or offend. Or offend. So there's no uh, rocking of the status quo or, uh, or a dissident voice, no trailblazers or pioneers. Um, 
you are up. So there's the, the nation, the kingdom, the, the seeker friendly. Um, you have a value for um, uh, political rallies and marches and political orientated prayer movements, that kind of thing, um, above everything else in your nation, showing that most of your time and, and your energy is going into political change and law change which is not cultural change, you've got to be clear of that. And therefore you lose um, your soul winning movements mm -hmm. because you believe that the energy must be in the lobbying, marches, rallies, and actually you can do an awful lot of work in intercession there, mm -hmm. but actually still not change very much because you've, you've lost um, uh, the, the momentum for soul winning. So those would be your starting points. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? It's pretty Polarization. good. Polarisation. Sorry? Polarisation. Yeah. I think the, the political spirit does not care what position you take. Yes. It can be a biblical truth as long as you occupy that position from a position of hatred towards somebody else. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we said it before, it's the emphasis on the outward the outward world, mm -hmm. the outward rather than the in inward yeah. experience of what's happening with the bride, mm -hmm. with the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you just look at the, the prayers of Paul and they're unrecognisable compared to how often, how how intercession is, is, is going mm -hmm. in many movements and yeah. places. Yeah. Um, you know, Paul says, I am wrestling continually in prayer for you. And his prayers are all about, you have more faith, you'll encounter God more, you'll yeah. open the eyes of your heart, you'll have more love in your life. Uh, and, and I just think what would happen mm -hmm. if we were wrestling in prayer for each other, for the bride of Christ, mm. that she would truly demonstrate mm. the fullness the power of God, mm. I think the nation could be changed in yeah. a day. And, yeah, yeah. and if we could divert yes. the prayer back into yeah. the apostolic prayers yeah. of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, We're so amazing. looking for an outside fix yeah. that's going to fix what's in here instead of us realizing as the church, it's what we have in the here. Being. And, and that being revealed yeah. and I just love that whole thing about you know can a nation be changed mm -hmm. in a day and I often have a daydream sort of go into visions how even from the home from the breakfast table how we disciple our kids even within churches yeah. and other structures how actually we disciple one another into such powerful living and taking hold of the goodness of God you could transform schools overnight yeah. by that. Mm -hmm. You could transform institutions mm -hmm. overnight if every believer took that and understood mm -hmm. who they were, actually the power of God that they mm -hmm. carry mm -hmm. yeah. and having that revelation of, uh, of that. Mm -hmm. So rather than the outside in, but from the inside out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think the church needs to decide what mountain it's sitting on. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Because I think that we only have two choices. Yes, yeah. it's a We're either on Mount Zion or we're on Mount Safon. We're either yeah. in God's Mount of Assembly or the enemy's Mount of Assembly. Mm. Nicely taken back to look for where we started <laughs> and the temptation of Christ. Well done. Do you want the kingdoms of the world or do you not? Brilliant. All right, well, let's end there. And I just wonder, Simon, if you could just draw us together in prayer. Right. Yeah. yeah. Lord, help. Yes, <laughs> great point. Help. Amen. Yes, yeah. it is. Come on. Like Bartimaeus, good. we pray, Lord, we want to see. Yeah. And Father, we ask you as prophets, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, that, that you would give us eye salve that mm. we could see. Mm. Because to some degree, we think we're dressed, but actually mm. we're naked. And Father, we pray that you would mm. clothe us with the revelation that Jesus came with his first words, repent yeah. for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Lord, we ask you for a fresh yeah. revelation mm -hmm. of understanding of what it means to be kingdom citizens in this world, that in we're in this world, but not of it. Mm. So help us to see that. Help us to understand how that affects the way we read the Bible, the way that we 
prophesy, the way that we evangelize, the mm. way that we interact with the world. Make us a kingdom people in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, thank you for joining us for this episode of... British Isles Council of Prophets, Big Conversations. Big? <laughs> big. <laughs> big. It was big. It was big conversations. We'll see you next time. Join us. You'll not want to miss these ongoing epics. You can see we're actually all a little bit shaken. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the reality. We're a bit like, oh, my goodness, did we just say all of that? But yeah. thank you for joining us and for being uh, ones who allow us to be um, ourselves and provocative. And it'll be our joy to see you next time on our big conversations. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.